Welcome to Turn the Page, the official podcast of the Syosset Public Library. This is Jessica with Syosset Library's podcast, Turn the Page, and we are very happy to welcome um, a resident and our newest um, interviewee. Would you like to introduce yourself and discuss your area of expertise? Sure. Hi, Jessica. Uh, um, My name is Mike Virgentino. I uh, live here in Syosset, and uh, I've been here about 30 years, but I was originally from the Bronx, and my interest is uh, from the Northeast Bronx was with a theme park known as Freedom Land USA, which was right in my neighborhood, and uh, over the last maybe 15 years or so, I've become uh, the quote-unquote historian uh, to keep uh, this park uh, in, in people's memory banks, to keep it in the timeline of America's theme parks, and to let young people such as yourself, who maybe never knew we had a theme park uh, of the likes of Freedom Land in the New York City area, to, to make sure you know about it, because it's very important in New York history and in theme park history. I agree. And um I do know about Freedom Land uh, because I had a great aunt um, who lived in Co-op City, which is the former (laughs) home of Freedom Land. And um, when we used to go to visit her, my parents would tell me about Freedom Land and how they used to go there. My father is from um, Pelham Parkway area of the Bronx. Um, And, you know, my mother uh, grew up on Long Island, but her father was um, always, well, always, it was a short-lived park, but we'll get into that, taking uh, the kids to Freedom Land. And very recently, um, about a few years ago, my husband and I, uh, my husband's only a few years older than myself, were driving up for a quick getaway to the um, Sleepy Hollow area, and we had to pass by Co-op City. And I mentioned to him, I'm like, oh, yeah, you know, there was this theme park, Freedom Land USA here. And he was like, no. And I'm like, it was basically on the scale of a Disney park. And he was says to me, really? So it just blew my mind because I thought everybody from this area knew that this existed. Well, you know, it's difficult. I I, have. Yeah, if you, if you're under sixty years old, of course you wouldn't have known of the park. You wouldn't have seen it because this year, uh, 2020, is the 60th anniversary of the opening uh, of Freedom Land. It opened on Father's Day in 1960. Uh, so if you're 60 and older, you either went there as a kid, or uh, if you were 16 at the time, 16 or older, you worked there. Um, and of course, you know, you're talking about the baby boomer generation. So if, if you were born uh, any time after really 1960, 1961, you would have, even if you went there as a baby, you would have no recollection of this park, uh, which has a, a, an interesting history, both uh, of how it was created, why it ended up in the Bronx, and why it only lasted five seasons. And uh, it, it's something that uh, I've been passionate about. I've written articles about it, as I say, for about 15 years, uh, magazine articles, online articles. And, uh, and about 10 years ago, I started uh, a Facebook page because I saw as Facebook was becoming popular, uh, a lot of pages, uh, you know, were touching on memories. You know, there were memories of Coney Island, Palisades Amusement Park, uh, just pages about certain neighborhoods of Brooklyn and the Bronx. And I saw there was nothing about Freedom Land. So I decided uh, to start uh, this Facebook page. And it's just not it's just not uh, a page where I put, put up a picture and say, you remember this ride or you remember this attraction. Because of Freedom Land, it was a, a, an American history theme park. Because of that and my exposure to it, I lived only about eight blocks away from the park, I got into American history. And I do a lot of writing and a lot of work uh, for uh, historic sites 
around the country. And that's where my passion came from, is growing up with this history theme park right in my neighborhood. And um, so I started the Facebook page. Uh, a number of years later, I expanded to Twitter. Uh, we do Instagram now. And about uh, three and a half years ago, I was interviewed for a book. Uh, the, this journalist friend of mine who I knew uh, uh, was doing a book about uh, the comparisons among uh, Disneyland, Walt Disney World, the New York World's Fair, and Freedom Land. He happened to be a, uh, a big Disney fan uh, and Disney expert. Uh, so he does this book, and he interviews me for the Freedom Land portion, and then asks me to write the introduction to the book. Well, the publisher sees that and says, how much does this fellow that you interviewed know about Freedom Land? He says he's like the guru or the historian. And he says, you think he's got a book in him? And not knowing that I, uh, my, uh, my career started as a journalist, I uh, went into public relations and marketing, so I'm a writer. And that I and the and the publisher didn't know I did, uh, was handling this Facebook page, so I said, "Of course, I can do a book on Freedom Land," and and that came out about a year ago, uh, beginning of 2019, and it has just been uh, the 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 people who reach out to me and say, wow, have you brought back memories of that great place? I, and, and even then, someone said, oh, I had forgotten all about that place. And now you're bringing the story of it to life uh, for me. So, so it, it, it's been a fun ride. What's the book called? The book is Freedom Land USA, The Definitive History. It's uh, published by Theme Park Press. Um, Theme Park Press publishes a lot of books about uh, Disney. And and you would say, well, why then would they publish uh, a book about Freedom Land? It's because there's a lot of Disney connections. So yeah, this is the, a really good place to start. Let's start, um, let's, yeah. let's start with the Disney connections. Well, uh, we're going to start with a fellow by the name of Cornelius Vanderbilt Wood. He was known as C.V. Wood. His close friends called him Woody. He was working in uh, the early 1950s for a research arm of Stanford University. It was called the Stanford Research Institute. So he, uh, they were doing research on all different uh, topics at the time. And two brothers walk in, Walt Disney and Roy Disney, and they had this idea for a theme park, which eventually would become Disneyland. So uh, Stanford Research puts a team together to study the feasibility and the location of such a park. And C.V. Wood, at the age of like 31, is put in charge of the team. The Disney brothers likes Wood so much, and, the, uh, and they like the work that was done on the feasibility study, that they hire Woody, and he technically becomes the first uh, – Walt, uh, uh, I should say, Disneyland employee. He becomes vice president and general manager. His job is to bring Walt Disney's imagination for the park to life. And Woody is in control of everything that involves from finding the vendors, the attractions, uh, building, finding the sponsors. Uh, and he uh, and Walt and Roy Disney uh, – have a good relationship, but like any kind of relationship, especially when you're dealing with creative people, uh, there is some, uh, uh, you know, there are some tough times. And then about a year after Disneyland opened, so we're talking about mid-1956 now, um, they decide to part ways. Some say uh, uh, Woody uh, saw the writing on the wall and decided to leave. Some say Walt Disney had him fired. Uh, we never really know the, f the full story. But coming out of that experience, Woody starts his own company to start building theme parks across the country. Uh, yes, there were theme parks before Disneyland. There was a Santa Claus land in the Midwest, and there were some other small theme parks around but Disneyland is seen as the uh, as the first of the modern theme parks um, but Woody now has this experience but you have to remember it is now 
1956, 1957. If you're living in New York City, you're not getting to Disneyland because parents were not taking a cross-country trip by car at that time. Uh, they uh, Middle-class uh, New Yorkers could not afford uh, to put their family of four on an airplane and spend a week or ten days in California. So the only way you were seeing Disneyland was on the Walt Disney uh, television show uh, every uh, Sunday night where he would do five or ten minutes of what's new at Disneyland. And if this was happening in New York, well, it was happening everywhere. Families from Chicago were not going to California or from Dallas or from Orlando. They were not traveling cross-country. So uh, a lot of business people across the country and developers said, well, look what Walt and Roy Disney did in Southern California. Why can't we do the same thing in our neck of the woods? And who better to create the parks and build the parks other than the guy who built Disneyland? So uh, Woody has a company together. He has some former Disney employees with him. He pulls in other people who have Hollywood experience, uh, you know, from uh, uh, Hollywood directors and production people. And he starts building parks across the country, one in Colorado, one outside of Boston. He then comes down and builds Freedom Land in the Bronx. And then he uh, gets involved in uh, putting together the Park Six Flags over Texas and Arlington. Now, all the parks that he was involved with either didn't get built for some reason or are now gone, with the exception of the one uh, in Arlington, Texas. And the reason for this is simply Woody came in and created and built the parks, but he did not manage the parks. The management was left to the local investors, the local business people in that particular uh, location. And the one in Texas was, uh, was backed by one of the uh, uh, big, uh, let's say, oil barons of Texas at the time, who was a solid businessman and, and put in a great, uh, uh, great foundation, business, a business model. So that's why that park is now going to be celebrating, I think, its uh, uh, 59th anniversary this year. It's changed hands over the years, uh, corporate hands, but it's still very profitable. While all the others failed because the people who were left to manage the parks didn't know how to manage, didn't know how, how to, how to uh, take care of expenses and crowds. Uh, they didn't have that kind of expertise like the Disney Brothers had. OK, so uh, that's the story in a nutshell of Woody. But he come when he comes to New York, uh, those Freedom Land had some similarities to his other parks. Really, Freedom Land, rather than a fantasy type of park, was strictly a park built on American history. And uh, and each themed area, Freedom Land had seven themed areas, each one uh, was a different period in time from America's history. So was it um, true, I believe I was reading, that it was supposed to be in the shape of a map of America? And it absolutely was. Uh, I have an aerial photo of the property. after the. Uh, it was built on marshland uh, in, in the northeast Bronx, so the property had to be uh, filled in and graded. And I actually have an aerial photo of the outline of a map of the United States. And then each of the seven themed areas were plotted down in this uh, map that showed the, the borders of the park. Um, the, uh, the park, uh, technically, if you include everything, is 205 acres, uh, but 85 acres were for the attractions. 85 acres were in the shape of the United States. The rest of the acreage uh, involved the maintenance buildings, the back lots, the, the parking lot. But when you compare the attraction area of 85 acres, compare that to the original Disneyland, which was only 65 acres. So it shows you it was, it was larger than Disneyland. And for those who remember Palisades Amusement Park just over the George Washington Bridge, uh, and that was a, a true old-time amusement park, 
that was only 30 acres. So Freedom Land at the time was the largest uh, theme park, amusement park, uh, really, that had ever been built. And, and, and it focused on seven areas of American history, six from our past, and then the seventh uh, was more a contemporary history uh, called Satellite City that kind of focused on the space race between the U.S. and Russia, because that's what was uh, bubbling at that time in the late 50s and early 60s. So what were the other six? Well, you came into the park in, a, in an area called Little Old New York, which was uh, lower Manhattan uh, that our, uh, my grandparents, or and maybe for you, your great-grandparents would remember from the, the late 1800s. And it was the recreation of the harbor, the shops, the winding streets of lower Manhattan. You would have a, a horse-drawn trolley car. Uh, uh, you would have uh, a parade every day, a marching band going through. You would have old-fashioned uh post office, uh, old-fashioned brewery from the 1800s that were popular uh, in the city at the time, Uh, and and even an actual functioning bank where the tellers were all dressed as as people dressed in the late 1800s. From little old New York, you moved to old Chicago of 1871, which was the year of the Great Fire. And they actually had an attraction where a building would catch on fire at the beginning at like every 15 and 20 minutes. <laughs> and you would have the, uh, the the firefighters who were character actors rushing through the streets of old Chicago with the water pump and hooking up the hose. And all the people uh, who were visiting the park for that day, especially the kids, could uh, – could man the water pump and, and pump it so the water would uh, fight the flames. It, that was something that was never seen in any other park at any time. I mean, that's so innovative. Even today, I think, you know, several parks like Universal Studios and even Disney, they'll do things um, on a big scale. But for the time period, that must have been absolutely unheard of. It, it, it was awesome. It was like, Wow, I'm watching a building burn, and I'm helping put out the fire by by manning the pump. Uh, it, it, it was just phenomenal. It, it was a showcase. As a matter of fact, um, Ed Sullivan was there the day before Freedom Land opened, and he uh, he f- uh, filmed certain parts uh, of the park to air on his show. Uh, the next night on Sunday night, and he even was just overwhelmed by the Chicago Fire attraction. He he prominently displayed that uh, on his show. So also in old Chicago, uh, you had uh, uh, they created their version of the Great Lakes. So you would have uh, paddle wheelers. Uh, you would have. Uh, uh, you would also have trolleys going through shops of the time. Uh, you would have uh, what they called Indian War canoes up on the water, uh, where maybe about ten to fifteen park guests would go in a canoe, uh, guided by uh, a couple of park employees. And the park employees were actual Native Americans. Freedom Land tried as much as they could to be as authentic to history as possible. Uh, Of course, history in an entertaining way, but they had, whenever they had uh, the Indian War canoes or they had the Indian village, they were actual Native Americans who were brought in uh, to talk about their culture, to do their their clothing uh, or their uh, war dancing. Uh, So Freedom Land always tried to be authentic when possible. Again, not missing out on the entertaining aspect uh, of, of the park. So those were some of the attractions you had in Chicago. Uh, later on, uh, a few years into, into the park's history, they added a midway, uh, typical of the midways you would see uh, in the 1800s at fairs, where they would have other kinds of attractions. They put in some kiddie rides for the little, uh, little tots that would come. Um, so uh, they would add over the course of the seasons some things that w- maybe weren't completely as historical, but uh, other ways to uh, attract more people to the park. 
So from old Chicago, you went out to the Great Plains, just like you were moving out to the to to the Wild West, and they had a fort that was uh, actually uh, a stockade fort built built on the site. And for kids like me who who grew up on westerns, to know that you had this huge fort in your neighborhood was like unbelievable. You know, you you could play cowboy uh, <laughs> and cowgirl, you know, yeah. all the time. And, and so they had a fort where they had actual uh, uh, gun gunfights that would break out without uh, without a moment's notice. Um, and they they and they would have other attractions such as. Uh, a shooting range, which seems obvious uh, uh, to have, you know, those arcade shooting ranges. It made sense to have it in the fort. Uh, you also had the uh, covered wagons there that if you wanted to uh, grab something to eat, you could go sit in one of the covered wagons like the Pioneers did. Uh, so they did uh, some attractions like this in the Great Plains, including they created a farm. Uh, they built a, a, a total farm, uh, complete with corn growing and, and, and a petting zoo, you know, all the goats and the cows. And it was sponsored by Borden. And uh, we had Elsie the cow who lived in the farm or, or who lived in the barn. And you could visit Elsie. Uh, it was known as Elsie's Boudoir. And she, you would go in there, and Elsie would have hay like up to uh, up covering her legs, and it looked like she was actually laying down in a big brass bed. Um, and you would have her two calves uh, also in their beds uh, nearby. And it was it was interesting because you didn't realize this as a kid, but as I got older and saw pictures of the inside that brought back memories, especially color pictures. The boudoir, or the inside of the barn, was, was kind of dark, dimly lit, and it, uh, there was a lot of uh, brass, there was a lot of red, red wallpaper, there was a chandelier. It looked more like a bordello than I a boudoir. just going to say it sounded <laughs> like it would have been Elsie's bordello. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what it looks like. I guess those but, things that you notice when you're an adult. Because it's not within your um, realm of understanding as a kid. As, as a kid, absolutely right. And uh, you don't know how many people uh, who are my age, a little older, who fondly remember seeing Elsie the cow. And uh, I, I do a, a, a lot of presentations uh, about Freedom Land. And when I show them the picture, I said, uh, people here who remember Elsie, look at the, this color picture closely. I said, is this how you remember it? Doesn't it look more like a bordello? And everyone, the shock on everybody's face, because <laughs> you're right. As a kid, that was nothing, you know. We 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 would uh, think of, though, what maybe our parents would. <laughs> so I guess uh, that was that was on the on the trip home. That was the joke that the parents were. <laughs> were that could, it, yeah, it could have very well been. Uh, so you, you had that out out there in the Great Plains. You also had stagecoach ride, uh, rides through the their recreation of the Rocky Mountains. And while you're on the stagecoach, you could come around the bend and all of a sudden be uh, run smack into a a, uh, a raiding party of Native Americans or uh, bandits who are holding up the stage. So it it was a lot of uh, a lot of interaction with the guests. It wasn't just you went on a ride and, and got off or you saw an attraction. You participated in these attractions. And I think that that's the difference it, between an amusement park and a theme park. You know, an amusement park that you go in, you go on rides, there's some things, you know, like some characters sometimes or some walking around, but theme parks are total immersion experiences. That's right. Well, it's it's the Disney model. You you you're you're immersed when you're on Pirates of the Caribbean. You know, you 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 get involved in in the in that battle between the, the pirate ships because you're floating right in between them. That that's that kind of uh, Disney. Uh, uh, creation, and that's for, because Wood had worked for Disney. He knew how to how to create uh, experiences such as this. And when he was building Freedom Land, as well as the other parks, former Disney employees, imagine Disney Imagineers, 
were hired by him. So there, there's a touch of Disney uh, through his parks, including Freedom Land. And also I mentioned that he had worked with a lot of broad uh, uh, Hollywood people. Uh, and that's why Freedom Land, I explained to people, was really like a movie backlot. If you, if you really uh, dissect all the attractions at Freedom Land and see how they were built and how they were positioned, uh, they weren't necessarily, uh, like the Chicago Fire, wasn't necessarily the size of a building uh, that it should have been. But because everything was done in proportion, the items that were in front of it, like the, the street light in front of it, and, and you as the audience are a little set back, it was smaller than normally it was, but it was all done as Hollywood does it. Everything like a movie set in proportion. So it would trick the eye. You would think the building was larger than it actually was. And then uh, when Wood was building Freedom Land, he involved a lot of Broadway people, too. So a lot of Broadway directors, uh, wardrobe people, stagehands, they, they participated in the, in the shows and the themed attractions that were part of Freedom Land. So you see, it wasn't just rides and amusement park. This was a total immersion experience, which was ahead of its time and unique. For its time. So um, really quickly, okay, so we had the New York area, we had um, Chicago. Oh, Chicago, yeah. There was... You had the Great Plains, where, where the Fort and Elsie were, and then from there, you, uh, you went farther west, you were on the west coast into San Francisco of 1907, the year of the Great Earthquake. And they actually had one of Freedom Land's four, do four dock rides, uh, were located uh, in San Francisco, and it was appropriately called Earthquake. Dark rides being you would get into uh, a car, and all of a sudden you go through uh, an entrance, uh, uh, and you go from room to room. And it's because it's dark inside, because that makes the attractions uh, pop uh, for the experience, for your eyes, for your sense, uh, your other senses. And uh, the company that created the dark rides and some other attractions for Freedom Land was known as Arrow Development. Arrow had created a lot of the early attractions for Disneyland. So uh, C.V. Wood knew of them. So he brought them in to create the, some of these attractions for Freedom Land. Um, a lot of people today will may not know the Arrow Development name. It's changed names over uh, the course of years as it's changed owners. But a lot of the coasters that you will see in parks such as uh, Cedar Point, and other amusement parks across the country have been built by Arrow in its uh, more modern uh, reincarnation. But uh, during uh, the 50s and 60s, Arrow was creating uh, a lot of dark rides. As a matter of fact, people who know um, Pirates of the Caribbean and uh, It's a Small World that were popular uh, with Disney, they were created by the same Arrow development company. Um, so you were in San Francisco. You had the earthquake ride. You also had a recreation of Chinatown, the Barbary Coast, Fisherman's Wharf. Um, and you also had an attraction there uh, that was like an offshoot of San Francisco called the Northwest Fur Trapper uh, Ride, where you got into these boats uh, and you actually went through the same wilderness that was explored by Lewis and Clark. For people familiar with Disneyland, uh, think of the Jungle Cruise. I was just thinking of the Jungle Cruise. Yeah. This is the same kind of format, except where on the Jungle Cruise, you uh, you might see uh, some of the animals more playful. Or I think they, uh, I don't know if they still have, they have an elephant with water spouting out of its trunk. They do. For, yeah. For <laughs> Freedom Land, it was more historically authentic of what Lewis and Clark would have seen. So you would have uh, gone through it past an Indian village. You would have seen coyotes. You would have seen a bear uh, possibly lunging at the boat. It, it, it wasn't the fantasy of Disney. It was more uh, the historic authenticity uh, that was the, the story of Freedom Land. Uh, what's interesting is that the boats that were used on that attraction as well as uh, uh, New York City 
a recreation of New York City tugboats that were used in little old New York, were built locally. They were built by the Miniford Yacht Yard uh, on City Island. And uh, Miniford has its own history. It, it, the Yacht Yard no longer exists, but it had built a lot of the America's Cup yachts over the years. And during World War II, it had built a lot of the small power boats that uh, our armed services use, especially over uh, in Europe and on the uh, shores of Normandy. So uh, Freedom Land went to a, a known shipbuilder or boat builder to build some of, of, it, of its boats uh, in the park. Uh, so from San Francisco, uh, you also had a, a train stop here. From Chicago, You could get on an authentic steam engine uh, either in Chicago or in San Francisco, and it would go, go around the park. Um, and why I say authentic, if you go to a lot of uh, parks today, you will see uh, trains that have very small engines and uh, uh, the, the, the cars that you sit in are more, more modern. Uh, Freedom Land had steam engines. One was from the late 1890s and one was from the early 1900s. Um, and the cars were from the 1920s. So think of what uh, train transportation was back in those years, and that's what you had at Freedom Land. Um, and uh, it, it was interesting because as the train pulled out of San, the San Francisco station, it went out slow enough that uh, a couple of bandits would always jump on the train and go through looking for the, the gold box mm. or, or trying to rob some of the kids. Uh, and again, it was the interaction with with the park guests uh, and the character actors uh, that made it a fun experience. As if you felt like you were actually in a Western, you were on television or in the movies. That was the kind of experience you had. So uh, from San Francisco, if you didn't get on the train, but you walked to the next themed area, you went into the Old Southwest, which was a recreation of uh, several towns like Santa Fe and others um, in the southwestern part of the country. You had the uh, the Western Saloon and Opera House, uh, where you could see uh, uh, authentic shows, shows created for Freedom Land that would have played at the time of the mid-1800s. You might have showgirls like Can Can Girls, things that uh, cowboys shows that they would have gone to back in the Old West. And also out in the streets, you would have had all of a sudden... Uh, out of nowhere, uh, a gunfight break out, and, uh, you know, the sheriff come running to uh, to take the bad guy and haul him off to jail. Uh, you had a beloved character actor uh, who was the uh, Wild West undertaker. And he was, think of an undertaker and how they would have dressed in the mid-1800s with the top hat, all in black, uh, and he would, whenever one of the cowboys was laid out prone, uh, you know, on the street, he would go with his tape measure and, and measure them for the pine box. And he had the meanest looking face. You know, he really got into the role, but he loved the kids. And I have more pictures of kids with him. And, and and most of them he won't smile. He he kept his persona. But once in a while you see a, the 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 lips upturned a little bit at, e, at either end where he, where he smiles a little bit. And he was a Broadway actor, as 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 was Freedom Land's first sheriff. What was his they, name? His name was John Fortner. It would not be a name popular uh, with people, but he was in a number of ensembles. Uh, you know, the crowd uh, on Broadway shows. And even uh, the sheriff, the first sheriff of uh, Freedom Land, his name was John Conant. He was in uh, uh, also the ensembles of Broadway shows. And as a matter of fact, he played the sheriff in 1959, for people who are old enough who are listening. Uh, there was a very popular show on Broadway called Destry Rides Again. It was also a movie. And it starred uh, Andy Griffith. And in that show, this, uh, the, uh, the Freedom Land Sheriff, John Conant, played the sheriff in this show. And uh, we also had another fellow who had speaking parts on Broadway um, by the name of Don Crabtree, 
who was the character actor of Freedom Land who portrayed the hero cowboy Johnny Freedom. And that's what Freedom Land is named after, Johnny Freedom. And uh, so he had he had roles on Broadway also. So while you had a few young character actors uh, who were not professionals, the majority of Freedom Land character actors all throughout all the themed areas were uh, Broadway or summer stock uh, actors. Some, some of the cowboys were Hollywood stuntmen. Uh, so again, for the authenticity uh, of, of of the park and and to engage the guests into feeling that they were right there at the time in history that this was occurring. So uh, you you had the old Southwest. You uh, you also had in this area uh, uh, an attraction that was a walk through attraction called the Casa Loca. It was the Crooked House. Crooked houses had been very popular. Uh, as early in in America as early uh, as the early 1800s, and what this was was a structure that was built like on a 20 to 25 degree angle. So when you walked in, everything was off kilter. So in in the Freedom Land Crooked House, uh, you had a uh, pool table, and some uh, uh, and the person walking you through the house would uh, sh- uh, hit the cue ball, and you think it's going in the upper right pocket because that's where normally it would go, but for some reason it goes in the lower left pocket. Or you would have a, uh, a soda can roll up a table and out a window, because it, everything, everything was an optical mm-hmm. illusion because you were on a 25-degree a angle. There's, um, I think there's uh, a few places like that around the country still, and they call them mystery spots, or at least the most popular one is called mystery spots. That's, um, that's very interesting. I didn't yes, actually yeah. know they had something like that there. Yeah, it, it, it's a, as I say, it's a very old attraction. They also had them uh, in the early 1800s, and they still have them today in, in areas of Europe. Um, and if you anyone wants to see uh, a one very similar to the one at Freedom Land, because it was built on the same plans as the, uh, the Freedom Land's Casa Loca, you have to go up to a family-owned park in New Hampshire in Lincoln uh, known as Clark's Trading Post. And they still have the Crooked House uh, up there. Uh, again, not the one at Freedom Land, but built up from the same uh, blueprints. And uh, so you would come out of the old Southwest, and you would go into New Orleans, and where it was Mardi Gras all the time. It was constant partying in New Orleans. And here you had a couple of dark rides also. You had uh, a tornado ride that simulated the tornadoes of the Midwest. And then you had the Buccaneer ride, a pirate ride. Uh, tying in with the Pirates of, of New Orleans. This uh, ride has a very interesting story to it. Pirates of the Caribbean at Disney were in the planning stages in the late 1950s. While Wood leaves the Disney Brothers and starts his own parks, he then comes and, uh, to Freedom Land and he puts in this pirate ride known as Buccaneer. And supposedly one of the people who helped him create this, or helped Arrow Development create this, was a former Disney employee who had worked on the early concepts of Pirates of the Caribbean for Disney. So as soon as Disney hears that Wood is opening Buccaneer in in Freedom Land, he puts a stop to any work that he was doing on uh, his, his pirate ride. Now, originally, Disney's Pirate Ride was supposed to be a walkthrough attraction. It was supposed to be like a wax museum. Well, when uh, Woody gets it for Freedom Land and with the help of Arrow Development, they have a car that goes through the various dark rooms. The car is shaped like a, a mini pirate ship. And you're going through the dark rooms, and though it was... Advanced for that time, but primitive by today's standards, you're going through a lot of the same uh, scenes that Disney ended up putting in the original Pirates of the Caribbean, such as uh, soon after you you enter, you have two ships fighting each other. Uh, And then you have other pirate scenes throughout. 
Now, once Freedom Land closed, uh, Disney revived his Pirate of the Caribbean attraction, and he decided to put a twist on it. Remember I said it was originally a, a, a walk-through wax museum type? Right. Then Woody decides to do it uh, with a car shaped like a pirate ship uh, as a dock ride. Well, based on... Walt Disney's experiences at the New York World's Fair in 64, 65 with It's a Small World. Once he takes It's a Small World back to California when the fair closes, he tells Arrow Development, you know, I want to take my pirate ride and make it a boat ride like It's a Small World. And that's why we have Pirates of the Caribbean the way it is today. So you're in yeah. New Orleans. You're in New Orleans still, and you have another popular attraction known as the Civil War ride. The early 1960s was the centennial commemoration of the American Civil War. So what they created was an actual battlefield, and you would ride in a horse-drawn uh, wagon that accommodated about 24 people. You were a correspondent, a newspaper correspondent. You were under a white flag of truce, and you're going through the camps, uh, through the northern camps, the, the Confederate camps, and you're going actually through the lines of the battlefield as the cannon and the guns are firing over you. This was one of the first uses of audio animatronics. Anyone who, who goes to the Disney parks, and let's talk about Pirates of the Caribbean again, know how the figures all move and, and, and interact uh, uh, with the people coming through the attraction. Well, that was designed by the Disney people. But again, Woody, when he was building Freedom Land, had used some of the Disney people. And in this attraction on the Civil War, you actually had uh, some of the figures actually move. And it was the very beginning or, uh, or the birth of audio animatronics. So uh, Freedom Land has that wonderful distinction of being one of the first parks to put that into use. A few years later, and it was still primitive, at the New York World's Fair, and you may have heard the stories, there was the, uh, the State of Illinois exhibit where they had Mr. Lincoln, Abraham yeah. Lincoln, and Lincoln actually stood up, and that was, back then in 1964, that was the wow moment. That was auto, audio animatronics taken to just the next step. Still very primitive from Freedom Land uh, to there, and then over the years, Disney's people uh, really, uh, you know, really fast-forwarded the technology to what we see today. Uh, so from New Orleans was the last area where you had uh, America's uh, past history. You went into your, your last themed area, which was Satellite City. And in Satellite City, uh, you had the recreation, technically, of Cape Canaveral with the, the missiles, uh, a bunker where you could uh, learn more about uh, the space, uh, the exploration of space. Um, and you would have some other attractions in this area that dealt with technology. In 1961, the second year of the park, uh, management realized that they, you know, they could get the kids, you know, if you're under 13 or 14, you could get the kids coming back for the history. But the older teenagers and the early, the young people in their early 20s, they saw it once, they're not necessarily going to see it again. How do we attract them to the park? Well, they decided to uh, build a uh, entertainment venue uh, where they brought in all the popular celebrity talent of the day, from uh, swing bands to rock groups uh, to comedians, and they couldn't put this anyplace else. You couldn't put this in the middle of the fort. You couldn't put this in San Francisco of 1907. It didn't fit historically. So they decided to put this uh, uh, entertainment venue in Satellite City. So they built the stage, and they uh, converted an area uh, uh, to the world's largest outdoor dance floor. 
and they called it the Moon Bowl. And they would have all the name entertainers of the day. Uh, there were over 150 celebrity entertainers. Uh, uh, the Benny Goodman Band, uh, Harry James and his orchestra, Count Basie, uh, Duke Ellington. And you had singers such as Bobby Darin, Louis Armstrong, um, uh, uh, Brenda Lee, uh, Leslie Gore, Neil Sedaka, The Four Seasons, The Temptations. All of the uh, all of the top billings. All to- top billing of that. You had top comedians. You had the Three Stooges show up. Uh, you had uh, uh, you had Tootie and Muldoon, who were known for Car Fifty Four. Where are you? You know the, the actors who played that. They would show up and get on stage. Uh, Alan Sherman is a name that uh, a lot of baby boomers would know. If you know the song uh, Camp Granada, the, uh, the, oh, the parody right. Hello, song. Oh, Hello, Meta. Hello, Father. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, Alan Sherman was there uh, doing his show. Uh, so that was another way to draw in uh, the, the teenagers, uh, the uh, young adults, the 20-year-olds, or even the older generation. You're talking... Um, the parents who came out of the war, you know, the World War II generation, who remembered the orchestras, so you were able to get them to come more into the park. One of the uh, most popular entertainers who came there, and he was there more often than anyone else, was Paul Anka. Uh, he ended up doing uh, not only performing there so often, he ended up doing a lot of uh, uh, singing a lot of the radio and television uh, commercials for Freedom Land. You had a lot of name entertainment that was just added on. You also had another, uh, in that same year, they built an outdoor arena uh, between San Francisco and New Orleans, and you have circus shows. You would have the elephant shows, uh, uh, tiger shows. A lot of the uh, hosts of New York City uh, kid shows were there. Uh, people who are listening will remember names such as Chuck McCann, Claude Kirshner, uh, Officer Joe Bolton. They all did live shows there. So, okay. Um, so that's all crazy. And just to think that it was, I mean, right next door to us here. Um, so what I'm going to do now is um, we are going to close this chapter. However, we are going to invite you back for part two, uh, where we're going to talk about why Freedom Land is not here anymore and, um, you know, why it was so short-lived, because it was only 1960 to 64? That's correct. Yeah, five seasons. All right. So once again, this is Jessica, and my guest was? Mike Virgentino. And, Mr. Freedom Land. <laughs> <laughs> and we are going to be in, um, inviting Mike back for part two of this um, this really interesting interview. Um, and for now, we are going to close this chapter of Turn the Page. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Jessica. It's time to close this chapter of Turn the Page. Join us for the next episode. Welcome to Turn the Page, the official podcast of the Syosset Public Library. Hi, this is Jessica at Syosset Libraries Turn the Page podcast, and I am welcoming back our guest. Uh, introduce yourself again, please. This is Mike Virgentino, uh, author of Freedom Land USA, The Definitive History. And we are going to do part two of our Freedom Land. Um, it's the 60th anniversary, were you saying? Yes, it's the 60th anniversary on uh, June 19th. Uh, of this year. It was Father's Day, June 19, 1960, that the park made its debut. 
so this so the first part of the interview we talked about freedom land and all of its attractions um which were very exciting and to think that this was just steps away from where we are now and literally steps away from where you lived was i mean it sounded like an absolute dream but we we get to the question of why did it fail so uh that's where we're going to go today correct that is absolutely correct, and we're going to uh, address some of the, the history of the property, uh, what occurred when Freedom Land uh, got there, and uh, and put to rest, I hope once and for all, one of the rumors that's been an urban myth of why Freedom Land failed. So we'll look at all of it. All right, wonderful. So where would you like to begin? Well, let's begin... Way back when, before any of us were around, uh, with the property, this part of the Bronx, uh, it was uh, actually uh, well known to the Native Americans going back many centuries, let's say three, four, five hundred years. And uh, uh, the Native American tribes that lived in in the region, uh, this was a... uh, a wonderful uh, nature, natural uh, area that we can't even imagine today with all the development. Uh, but the streams, the uh, the, the uh, other waterways, the fish, the the crabs and the clams that were all in this area of the Bronx uh, that provided uh, nourishment and a wonderful lifestyle, I guess, for the Native Americans, uh, because. Uh, you know, the Hutchison River uh, runs into this area. It empties into East Chester Bay. If, if you ever look at, at a study of the Bronx before it was developed, you couldn't imagine the number of streams that ran through the Bronx that have now been covered over or paved over uh, the last 200 years. Uh, also in this area uh, of uh, where the Hutchison River Parkway uh uh, travels in the northeast part of the Bronx is where Anne Hutchison settled after she left New England, and she settled there with her family. And unfortunately, due to some uh, disagreements between uh, Native American tribes as well as uh, some of the tribes and uh, the early white settlers in the area, uh, Anne and her family uh, were massacred. Oh wow! Okay. Uh, and it's and it's literally not far from where the New England Thruway overpass crosses with the Hutchison River Parkway. That's where she lived, and that's where uh, she and the family were massacred. And that's going back to the 1500s. So as you can see, this was a wonderful place in a sense, from uh, a place to live, except, unfortunately, uh, when you had the disagreement uh, that that befell Anne and her family. Um, And then as we move into more the modern area, now we're talking uh, the early 1900s, in the late 1800s, this part of the Bronx was uh, had been part of Westchester County. All of the Bronx was really the southern portion of Westchester County. And in the late 1800s, um, New York City started annexing um, uh, other surrounding areas to be part of the city. So you really uh, took everything that is in the Bronx today – up to like Pelham and to Mount Vernon and to Yonkers, all became part of the Bronx. And um, this area where where Freedom Land was located uh, on this marshland originally was was part of more of the of the Pelham neighborhood. Um, and that's why you have uh, right below Co-op City today. You uh, and you've had for many years. Pelham Bay Park, the word, and you have Pelham Parkway. It's because it, it's all going back to the Pelham Grant uh, that was given hundreds of years ago uh, to this area. But the land that we're talking about is uh, that involved Freedom Land is about 400 acres of marshland, and the the marshland. Uh, they tried to put on several occasions a municipal airport 
in this area. Now I'm going back to the 20s and 30s, and then again they tried uh, a heliport. I think it was post World War II, all on the property, but it, it never could be developed because you cannot put. An airport, or and think of the planes back in the 20s and 30s compared to the jets of today. But you couldn't really put an airport on marshland, so uh, the properties down in this area never got developed. And being one who grew up in this neighborhood from the 1950s, as the neighborhood got more developed, I lived up on a ridge that looked down toward the marshland and that uh, if anyone who goes by there today you would have looked down off the ridge into freedom land down off the ridge into co-op city and everyone who grew up in that neighborhood would refer to that area where the marshland was as the valley uh, because we were all up on a higher ridge and you would go down into the valley and even people who live there today they don't know why but they re reference it as the valley um, well, so nothing can really be done with this marshland. So in 1951, the uh, the current owner of the 400 acres that we're talking about is uh, the family that also owns at the time Yonkers Raceway. Uh, a manager for the family comes to see the real estate baron of the day, whose name was William Zeckendorf Sr. A name that we Let's, see a lot around here. Um, that's correct. Right? If, a, a, anyone who goes uh, goes uh, uh, in Nassau County to the uh, to the shopping area off Old Country Road will see Zeckendorf Boulevard. That's because Zeckendorf was the man behind uh, the Roosevelt Field Mall. Uh, but uh, Zeckendorf was a developer and a real estate baron all across the country. Uh, he would build uh, shopping centers. He would build uh, apartment buildings, office buildings all across the country and even internationally. And if he didn't uh, construct uh, the buildings, he would uh, end up owning them. He would take the mortgages on the buildings. So he, he, he was... Uh, the real estate go-to guy of the day. And he had a company called Web and Nap. He started working for this real estate company in the about the 19 late 1930s early 1940s where they were the company was owned by two separate uh, individuals, Web and Nap. Well, over the years Web and Nap decided to retire and get out of the business and Zeckendorf being one of the employees bought them out. So he kept the name of the company, but he is now uh, the owner uh, of Web and Nap. So uh, the manager for the family of Yonkers Raceway comes to Zeckendorf and says, look, w w the family owns this 400 acres of marshland that we can do nothing with. It's not generating any income. We don't know what to do with it. Uh, we come to you as the real estate expert to help us figure out what to do with the property. Well, Zeckendorf has this idea. He says to them, how about we swap properties? Uh, I don't, uh, my research has not found a, a financial transaction here. Uh, all I have found was that he gave uh, the family of Yonkers Raceway his, one of his properties, and they gave him the 400 acres. And the property he gave them was uh, a four-block area on uh, approximately 34th Street and 5th Avenue in Manhattan, uh, where there was a building. And he had just convinced uh, the owners of the Orbox uh, department store that was on 14th Street to move into his building at 5th and 34th. And we're talking now 1951. And he says uh, to the representative of the uh, Yonkers Raceway family, I have this building. Orbox is going to move into it. The building has uh, a mortgage. Uh, of X amount of dollars, uh, or box, uh, they're going to provide rent of X amount of dollars. You will actually be making almost $50,000 in profit every year once you uh, apply the money to the mortgage, and then the rest will be profit. And back well, in that day, that was even more uh, than it sounds like now. Right. That was a considerable amount of money back then. So 
they agree to the deal. Zakendorf comes in possession of the 400 acres of marshland in the Bronx, and uh, the Yonkers Raceway family takes the property in Manhattan. Now, why would Zeckendorf want a piece of property that you can't do anything with? Well, as all real estate people are, they're, they're kind of like visionaries. They, they don't see the property today. They see it 10 years from now, 20 years from now, a property that possibly can generate significant investment income. And Zeckendorf was like a painter. He preferred a blank canvas that he can create whatever he wanted. A blank canvas uh, from, uh, for a real estate uh, investor is much better than uh, having a property with buildings on it where you're, you might have to take down buildings, you might have to adhere to certain zoning regulations. He had 400 acres of open land, and he just sat on the property while all his other investments around the country and around the world were generating income. Well, he sits on the property, and uh, Zeckendorf, being in the real estate business, knew the Disney brothers. And uh, in our previous conversation, we talked about the connection uh, between uh, Disney and uh, Cornelius Vanderbilt Wood and then uh, Freedom Land. Uh, so he knew the Disney brothers, and uh, I think, though I am not sure, he may have been a silent investor somehow in Disneyland. But when uh, uh, C.V. Wood left the employ of the Disney Brothers and started making his, uh, uh, created his own company to build uh, other theme parks across the country, William Seckendorf was an investor. He invested in Woods Park in Colorado. He invested in Woods Park up uh, outside of Boston. Of uh, of course, he he was prominently involved in Freedom Land, and he was also an investor in Woods Park at Six Flags Over Texas in Arlington. So uh, he uh, knows Wood already, and uh, when Wood is building these parks, Zeckendorf says, "Why can't we put a park in New York City?" Originally, the thought was possibly to put it in Flushing Meadow. Robert Moses, uh, who kind of controlled a lot that went on in New York City, uh, said, absolutely not. I'm bringing the 1964-65 World's Fair uh, to Flushing Meadow. The World's Fair had already been approved in the late 1950s. We're talking 57, 58, at the same time that the plans for Freedom Land were being developed and announced in 1958 at William Zeckendorf's uh, office in the Empire State Building. And uh, it is announced that uh, Freedom Land is going to be placed in the Bronx, not on the complete 400 acres of marshland, but they were going to take 205 acres of that for the park, its, uh, its backstage or its outbuildings, as well as its parking lot. And they were going to put Freedom Land up in that location. It was really the only, only uh, other open space in New York City at that time that, that could take on a project this large. So uh, Freedom Land is built, but unbeknownst to uh, C.V. Wood is that Zeckendorf and others that he knew in the real estate world had other plans for the property. But they couldn't build on the property because of the marshland. They had come up against a um, uh, an issue where the Army Corps of Engineers said you can't make uh, or you can't place massive development on marshland. Uh, and we and at that time you had to think in the late fifties, early sixties, we don't have the issues with uh, with marshland that we uh, – development issues with marshland that we do today uh, from the environmental standpoint. But they just felt you couldn't put uh, significant structures on marshland because uh, of the shifting of, uh, of the water uh, would make any structures uh, unstable. So the Army Corps of Engineers had said if you want to put anything permanent on the property – 
Uh, you would have to drive pilings into the ground, deep into, into the ground, and you would have to test them six months, 12 months, for 20 years to see with the incoming and outgoing tide of, uh, of East Chester Bay, uh, would those pilings move? Because if those pilings moved, anything you put on the property would also be affected in a similar way. Um, they couldn't wait that long. They couldn't wait 20 years to build anything on the property. Uh, and we're getting away from freedom land at the moment because um, by the mid to late 1950s, New York City, the politicians and the city planners knew that certain areas of the city were going to collapse in the mid-1960s. That included the South Bronx, uh, the, the Grand Concourse, Yankee Stadium area, and areas farther south. It also included sections of Brooklyn. And the reason they knew uh, that these areas were going to collapse economically uh, goes back a few years earlier. After World War II, after the Korean War, uh, the soldiers came home. A lot of them were, were the young guys who went into those wars at age 18 to, let's say, 35. Well, when they came back home, uh, they usually came back to the homes or to the neighborhoods where their parents and grandparents lived. And a lot of these soldiers were the Italians, the Irish, the Germans, the Jews, the Polish, who were living uh, in the apartment buildings in the South Bronx and in Brooklyn. And these apartment buildings were old, and they did not have elevators. You had five- and six-story walk-up buildings. Well, they knew that with the, the soldiers returning from war, those who weren't married were going to get married. They wouldn't have wanted to live in the same areas that they grew up. They wanted their little patch of green and their white picket fence. And that's why you have uh, them moving out to Queens, some moving out to Staten Island, which was, by today's standards, it was very rural back then in the late 50s. And 60s. I don't even know if they had a subway. I mean, that's hard. That's out. hard to imagine. <laughs> right. I mean, but really. Also, <laughs> right. But also very prominent here on Long Island, you had the building uh, of uh, such developments as Levittown. So it's it's interesting that you mentioned that. Um, and um, this, I, I'm hoping to air this episode around Father's Day or these two episodes around the actual 60th opening. But uh, during this recording, um, I and this is actually a good place to plug the fact that, yes, our, our librarians at Syosset Library are working very hard behind the scenes. Um, this is the COVID-19 crisis that will hopefully be um, on the, you know, uh, sloping down by the time this episode airs. But um, I am a homeowner in Levittown. So I took all of our recording equipment to from the library to my house. And this is being recorded in an original Levitt house. Wow, so you're, you're part of history. You're part of Long Island history. I am, although I'll say that we did recently renovate our original Levitt house, so it doesn't look as much as it did like a year ago. It looked like an original Levitt A-frame ranch. Um, but my grandfather, who did fight in World War II, owned one of the first original Levitt houses, which is only a few blocks away from here. So that right, fits right. very nicely into your story. And he did take excuse me, my mother and her siblings, to Freedom Land several times. Oh, okay. So we're going full circle we're here. Going fu we're fan, going full fantastic. circle, yes. We're all part of history in, in some way. Um, so as I was saying, these returning uh, soldiers are uh, now moving out of their original neighborhoods that they were raised in. So the city knew that these areas uh, were going to economically collapse. They wanted to make sure that as many of the residents stayed within the city limits as possible, not only uh, because uh, these people pay taxes, but you also wanted to keep the jobs in the city. So they the city decided to commission several housing uh, developments. One was Rochdale Village in Queens, Another was Starrett City in Brooklyn, and another was Co-op City in the Bronx. The problem with Co-op City is 
you couldn't build 25 to 30 story buildings on marshland. The Army Corps of Engineers would not allow it. You, they wanted you to test the property for 20 years. Well, the politicians, uh, Mayor uh, Robert Wagner, Governor Nelson Rockefeller, uh, the city planners, the city developers, such as uh, Robert Moses, uh, uh, landowners such as William Zeckendorf, who, who wanted to see a profit on the land, and the construction unions, especially the Teamsters Union, could not wait to uh, 20 years for the jobs and for the construction of, uh, of a housing unit in the Bronx uh, on the magnitude of Co-op City. So someone twisted uh, the Corps' arm, or both arms, somehow, and I, I can never find out who it is, but it was probably all of the above that I named collectively. And uh, the Army Corps of Engineers comes back and says, okay, if uh, we won't wait the 20 years uh, to uh, study uh, the pilings driven into the land. If you can build structures on the marshland, temporary structures that are two to three stories tall and last for five years where the foundations don't crack, the walls and ceilings don't have cracks, none of the buildings collapse, will grant you the variances that you can build these apartment buildings. Well, when you, those are people who remember Freedom Land, or if you walk into any theme park or amusement park today, how tall are the buildings? Two to three stories. Freedom Land's buildings were, uh, lasted the five years with no structural issues. They lasted exactly the five years and during the process of uh, each uh, succeeding season of Freedom Land, uh, the management of the park, which included William Zeckendorf and later included the pension fund of the Teamsters Union, are driving Freedom Land into bankruptcy. So after the five years, they could walk into bankruptcy court, declare the park a bankrupt, and when they were asked, well, what are we going to do now uh, with the bankrupt, this is your assets, this is your liabilities. Well, we're going to sell and auction off some of our assets to generate money to pay our liabilities. And then here are the plans for Co-op City. So Co-op City was planned in the late 50s, unbeknownst to the general public. Uh, the variances were granted, so after five years, uh, Freedom Land uh, could be dismantled and Co-op City uh, could be raised. Now, how did I find out a lot of this was because I came across a newspaper interview from 1970. It was a syndicated uh, 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 news article in which William Zeckendorf uh, was interviewed. And uh, they were talking about his career in uh, real estate, uh, the money he made, the money he lost, his own uh, company's bankruptcy, which occurred was occurring at the same time as the Freedom Land bankruptcy. And uh, the person or the reporter asked him, said, well, you were, had been in the amusement park business uh, uh, for a while. Uh, what can you tell me about Freedom Land? And his quote is, well, of course you know Freedom Land was just the placeholder for the land. Hmm. And that's what convinced me, which I had always surmised, that Freedom Land was built to fail. It was built to last the five years to gain the variances uh, so that they could place Co-op City on the marshland. That's so interesting, and I know um, some people, you know, my parents included, who lived in the area and attended Freedom Land, they always sort of assumed it was because it was seasonal, and, um, you know, like uh, Disney, for instance, down in Florida, the weather is generally good most of the time and conducive to um, an outdoor park. They assumed it was because it was only, you know, available during certain months. And and that's a great assumption, uh, and there's nothing wrong with that. Yes, Freedom Land could only operate seasonally. Uh, for a couple of years, it opened on weekends as early as April, and it may have stayed open on weekends 
as late as early October. Uh, and the reason why I say that is because a lot of the uh, employees in the park were either high school or college students. So you could not really have them during the week in May. Or you could not have them during the week in September. So the park would stay, uh, extend the season and open, let's say, Friday to Sunday in April, as well as in September and October. Uh, there, there were a number of, of reasons of uh, to figure why Freedom Land didn't last. But, but you need to place it in perspective because, yes, Disneyland in California could be open year-round. Uh, eventually, Walt Disney World in Florida could be open year-round. Right. But the, but the parks in the northern part of the country, from the, from the early amusement parks in the 40s right up to amusement parks in the north, let's say up to like 20 years ago, always closed – uh, you know, uh, soon after the summer ended. So let's say a few weeks after Labor Day, they would open a few weeks, especially just on weekends before Memorial Day. The, the, the same uh, seasonal timeline that Freedom Land had, because what what parks do today was not even a thought in anyone's mind back <laughs> in the 1960s, which was let's open in October for Fright Fest. Oh, that's Let's, that's big. I have to say that right. is so it's, it's so big. That's right. Let, uh, if you go to Hershey Park during Christmas time, they decorate the park with lights. They don't open all the rides, but they open a considerable amount of them. But uh, all of this was not even a marketing thought in the 1960s. None of the parks do it. So if if people would think that Freedom Land. Uh, could fail because of not being open year-round, well, why not Hershey Park? Why not uh, other parks all across the northern tier of the country? They were all seasonal. Yeah. Freedom Land, yes, there were other issues, uh, but Freedom Land was driven from the beginning. Once C.V. Wood uh, cut the opening day ribbon and left the park, he was already developing his park in Texas, he just came in to create and build the parks, and it was up to the local management whether a park survived or not. Well, the Freedom Land management had other plans for the park, so this is and actually, that was to build Co-op City. So this is very interesting because it kind of comes up now. Um, as I'm sure you know, there, or you might not know, um, there is a, um, a Lego theme park, which is opening or has soft opened up near Goshen in Goshen, New York. And yes. when I was talking about it to family members, you know, they like the first thing they thought, well, Freedom Lands didn't make it in New York because seasonal, blah, blah, blah. Well, you know, now it seems like obviously, you know, Lego Fright Fest would probably draw crowds. Um, but it's there was so much more to what happened with Freedom Land than that. Right. That's right. See, Freedom Land could have been successful if they wanted it to be successful, and if they had the foresight of what else could we do year-round to attract people to the park. Here are some examples that, of things they could have done. In their little old New York section, imagine decorating all of little New, old New York for the holiday season and, and having Christmas carolers go through. You had the Macy's store there. Um, you you could have had uh, uh, again the horse drawn trolleys. You could you could have made it a holiday from like no uh, Thanksgiving right through New Year's. You could have uh, you could have had uh, with the train that they had. You could have done a Santa Claus Christmas train through the park. Um, there are a number of things that could have been done. Not necessarily opening the entire park but certain areas of the park to generate revenue and the crowds, you could have still had entertainment there. We talked about uh, last time all the, the name talent that came to Freedom Land. Well, all you had, a, you already had a 300-seat um, indoor attraction uh, known as the uh, brand of Space Rover where they held the concerts, uh, mini concerts in the summer. Uh, so why couldn't you do that in the winter? It, the possibility was there, but they either didn't think of that or they preferred not to generate any more 
uh, interest in the park than, than necessary, knowing they wanted to drive it into bankruptcy. That's beyond interesting. And, I mean, it's funny. You know, when I was younger, and I'm, I just turned 40 in um, October, and, uh, you know, I mean, I remember, like, these little roadside attractions that were around when I was a kid. Like, there was something, I think, called McGinnis's, and... Yes, that, McGinnis's. I, re- I used to bring my son there, yes. I loved McGinnis's, and that was the best, but now I think, like, it's like a bank or something. I mean, at the time, it seemed really big, and I, it wasn't actually called... McGinnis's. I found out it was called something else, but there was like McGinnis's restaurant next door, so everybody assumed yes, it was correct. McGinnis's. Yes. You yeah. know, but there, but it's like all this bygone um, Long Island bygone stuff, and um, you know, we have Adventureland, and now we have Splish Splash. But just the thought that there was something so big, like Advent, like um, excuse me, like Freedom Land, and that it could possibly, I mean, you know, in an alternate world where maybe the development wasn't considered for anything else, we could have still had this uh, it's just it's yeah. it's just this weird it's like a weird alternate universe to think about well w- what occurs and and mcginnis was was small but what occurs with a lot of these parks as case in point with freedom land is that the land is more valuable yep. for other uses uh, than for a theme park or an amusement park. Think of Palisades Amusement Park. It's now a high-rise residential development. A lot of people don't know that there once was a trolley park, which uh, were popular back in the in the uh, turn of the century into the 1900s. It was a trolley park where LaGuardia Airport is. It became more valuable to place an airport there than to have an amusement area there. So that's why a lot of these older parks, uh, p- uh, parks from years ago, no longer exist. Isn't it amazing that a uh, that the largest city in the world, uh, New York City, does not have uh, a themed attraction or any kind of attractions yeah. uh, within the city limits, with the exception of, of the uh, restoration of what they're doing at Coney Island? Mm-hmm. But there's nothing else. We yeah. we had uh, there was a park uh, in the South Bronx in the 30s and 40s known as Starlight Park. Mm-hmm. There were amusements at Classen Point in the Bronx. There was a uh, an amusement park on the northern part of of Manhattan uh, going back 50, 60 or more um, more than 60 years. It's probably 80, 90 years. Staten Island had one. We had uh, uh, Playland out in uh, Queens. Uh, so you had all these locations, and now the we, only one yeah. in New York is the Co- little Coney Island area, and you have Rye Playland up in Westchester County. And in Syosset, we had, what was it, Lollipop Farms? The Lollipop the Farm. Lollipop I live Farm. right there, Lollip- <laughs> what I never saw it, but my uh, friends who lived out here uh, just have such fond memories of Lollipop Farm. When, when the Syosset Library, um, obviously, you know, when our local history department, when our, when our building, I mean, obviously, because like I said, our librarians are still working very hard, um, but the building is closed at the moment of this recording. When it's open, right. we do have several pictures at, um, of Lollipop Farm, and I believe there's yeah. a few websites. You can see, like, the little the little train seems to be the biggest attraction there. There was, like, this teeny <laughs> tiny little train, and a conductor yes, would yeah. go on it. Yeah, that train, I think, is at, a, at another location it in is. the county now. Yeah, it yeah. is. There's, I know there's a park that has them that rides. The, it's like um, it, it conserves them. And I think um, sometimes in the summers, on the weekends, you can actually get in and ride them. Although I've heard yep. that the lines are absolutely beyond anything you would believe. So <laughs> I don't know. Uh, but, yeah, Lollipop Farm, Bygone Syosset. Um, right. Yeah. So uh, is there anything else you'd like to share about this? I mean, this has been like probably, I think, one of the most interesting um, interviews we've done um, in recent times about, you know, bygone, I keep saying that term, uh, you know, like past attractions right. in the New York area. Right. Well, one thing I would like to add to this is to, is to shoot down the, what has become an urban myth about Freedom Land. A lot of people... Uh, to this day, will say that the New York World's Fair was the final nail in the coffin that 
caused Freedom Land to close. Now, how did how did this myth uh, develop? When Freedom Land filed for bankruptcy, the uh, William Zeckendorf was no longer involved at that time in the fifth year of Freedom Land. His company, Webb and Knapp, had already gone into bankruptcy proceedings itself. So in order for him to pay off his debts, he had to sell a significant portion of the uh, of the Freedom Land Park. The property, it was remember, it was built on land he owned. He had to sell off a significant portion of it, and it beca- uh, fell into the ownership of the pension fund for the Teamsters Union. So the Teamsters Union became the driving, managing force of Freedom Land over the last year, year and a half of the park. And they put their own person in charge of the park. His name was uh, Hyman Green. When Freedom Land filed for uh, uh, bankruptcy and Hyman Green was pressed for the reasons why, he, of course, didn't want to get into the entire story that I've just conveyed to you about, the, you know, the park being a placeholder to build Co-op City. So he just uh, publicly stated, well, of course, you know, we couldn't compete with the New York World's Fair. But that was just his excuse. He just needed to provide something to the press and I have uh, documentation that United Press International, UPI, took that quote and blasted it in newspapers all across the country. But nothing else was said other than we couldn't compete with the New York World's Fair. Meanwhile, one had nothing to do with the other. The New York World's Fair opened in April of 64, as did uh, Freedom Land opened about for the season about that same time. The plan for Freedom Land was to close it at the end of 64 when it reached its five-year lifespan so they could file for bankruptcy. The New York World's Fair was only going to last two years, 64 and 65. So even if you lost some of the crowd to the fair, in 66, people were going to have to look for other entertainment venues and people would have come back. So it was just an excuse that he gave out that uh, ended up in the newspapers with our parents not knowing anything else that was going on. You know, it's not like the media is today uh, where a false (laughs) statement is reported within seconds. Um, You know, our parents had no other knowledge, so they said, oh, can't compete with the World's Fair, and that's what got passed down to the children, to, to someone like me, or to others uh, a little older than I am who remember from, oh, couldn't compete with the World's Fair, and then you just went on with life. Oh, okay. It, it, but when you do the research and you find out what the plan was, then you know that Hyman Green's uh, comment was just a flippant comment uh, <laughs> just to say something rather than reporting what actually was going on. Well, that's so. Uh, yeah. So that so that's why I like to tell people, uh, and and when I give presentations, I usually ask, "Has anyone heard that the World's Fair caused Freedom Land to close?" And I would say, maybe a third to a half of the audience would raise their hand, and I said, "You're going to leave here, understanding that the World's Fair had nothing to do with the closing of Freedom Land." Thank you for debunking that. It's um, it's a it's a testament to research, really, uh, which obviously librarians appreciate because there's you know, I, I think most of the time, um, especially now, a lot of people would say, well, you know, we have the internet. Why do we need this and that? Because you need to you 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 can't just go with the first source. You need to cross check your sources. Um, even if somebody says something, it might not necessarily be true. So that, that's correct. Yeah, now, and I'll I'll be the first one to admit that has happened to me. Everybody, when, when I, it's happened to everybody, right. even when even I librarians. Wrote, right. When I wrote uh, the book that, on Freedom Land that was published uh, uh, in early 2019, I had all my ducks in a row. I had double, triple checked things. I found out later on, once the book came out, a couple of people reached out to me and said, I worked at the park, or I helped build the park. 
that there's one little piece of it. I'm not going to tell you what it is. One little piece of information that's not untrue, but it's a little ambiguous. Okay. Right. And uh, but I have they have since explained to me things I did not know because not everything is documented, not everything is written down. So I w- was able to confirm this from two or three different sources of people who were there involved with the park at the time. So I'll have the luxury, because I am now working on a follow-up book uh, for more stories of Freedom Land, I'll have the luxury uh, in the introduction of just correcting this little <laughs> this, uh, this little piece of information. But I kind of do take pride that everything else that I wrote in this book, and it's about 300 pages long, everything else is held up. Right. Uh, people have come to me and, and uh, now have confirmed, yes, you know, that, that that is correct. I remember this or I spoke to that person. So everything else has, has pretty much held up. That's really and that's really exciting uh, that you're coming out with a follow up. What will the, do we have a working title or we uh, are gonna, no. we're going to hold that no. off? OK, no, no, no. We don't have a working title yet. What I when the book first came out, um, people came out of the woodwork when they heard about it. Uh, and and contacted me through the publisher uh, to say, I worked there. Uh, I, I was a 15-year-old who worked on the attraction. I helped build the park uh, with new stories that I had never heard before. Um, and they have given me a wonderful uh, uh, timeline of stories from behind the scenes. I just spoke with a, a woman the other day who was 14 years old, ended up living only six blocks from where I grew up. She was a, f- a number of years older, and it was her first job when uh, when she was 14, and she had some insight into the park. Uh, store, or, or they knew someone who, who, who conveyed certain information. So I'm gaining a lot more information uh, of the inner workings of the park. Um, what also is helpful and what was helpful in this first part of the uh, the first book, so many newspapers now going back uh, decades are being digitized. So I can easily, you know, from your, your desktop, you can just plug in Freedom Land for a certain newspaper and articles will pop up. So I'm finding out so many more uh, background stories that weren't known before. And that's going to be the premise of the book, all the stories that have come to light since the first book was published. Uh, And I I think easily it could be another 200 to 250 page book. Well, thank you so much for sharing all of this with us. Um, So Syosset's own Mike Virgentino or Mr. Freedom Land, I believe you said that. uh... (laughs) Uh, thank you so much for all of this. Um, we look forward to hearing more from you and, um, you know, uh, seeing you at the library when the library is open. And uh, excuse me, I should say seeing you at the library when the building's open, because we're, we're still we're still working, even if the building itself uh, has to be closed to the public for health and safety reasons. Uh, but um, thanks again. Um, Thank you so much. And um, if there's uh, nothing else you'd like to leave us with, I, we are going to close this chapter of Turn the Page. I just want to say a big thank you uh, for allowing me to chat about my f- favorite subject since childhood. And I hope others, uh, it's brought back memories and provided new information uh, for people who enjoyed that great park. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you, Mike. It's time to close this chapter of Turn the Page. Join us for the next episode.